everybody, if I might have your attention, I'm really glad that you're here, whether you know it or not, I believe with all of my heart that this is a divine intersection for every single one of you. And I believe that the Lord specifically has designed and purposed that you would be here. And my hope is as we progress, you're going to see that more and more. I want to compliment the Spirit of God. I want to compliment God in His faithfulness. And I want to remind you, of course, we have just come through Easter, and uh, we were reminded in the resurrection of Jesus that it was the Holy Spirit who rose him from the dead, the Scripture says. So the same Spirit who hovered over the chaos before creation, who hovering is a maternal expression, and brought order, and brought light, and brought life, That same spirit then who spoke to the prophets throughout the Old Testament and spoke through kings, that same spirit who was foretold in the description of David's branch or shoot that came up, that same spirit who came upon Jesus at his baptism, that same spirit who led Jesus into the wilderness where he defeated the lies of the enemy, that same spirit that brought Jesus then to the, to the uh, synagogue and he read in the synagogue, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, the same spirit who Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit who came upon the disciples at Pentecost filled them so that now that Spirit would change the chaos and the darkness and the confusion in the hearts of people. That same Spirit who rose Jesus from the dead is in this room with us today. And this is important for you to understand as we progress into a, a grasping of a potential um, new way of doing things that invites the spirit of the living God into your life and into the life of your church, your fellowship, your family. Who is this guy up here yelling at you? <laughs> My name is Les Beecham. I am the lead pastor at LifeGate Church in Omaha, Nebraska. Our website is lifegate.church if you want to creep us, okay? Lifegate.church. The church is 47 years old. We are a life-giving, spirit-filled, and we are a presence-drawn church, which is very similar as we're in association with Radiant Church. I've been there 35 years. I've been the pastor, the lead pastor, for 26 of those years. And we have gone through everything you can imagine with regard to the expressions of the Holy Spirit. We've had the wonderful. We've had the powerful. We've had the creepy. We've had the weird. We've had the balanced. We've had the controlling. And as you might guess, None of those really had to do with the Holy Spirit, but they had to do with the human spirit. And so we have had expressions of the Spirit's ministry and welcomed them, all 47 of those years. And so it's important for you to understand that probably you have some of these expressions as well. When I first came to LifeGate Church, it wasn't LifeGate. It was Trinity Church Interdenominational interdenominational we were birthed in the charismatic movement and we are a church split to encourage you we've reconciled since then and we're closest friends with our mother church that we split from years before but that only after great great upheaval and great pain to many many people and so in the midst of that we've always welcomed the holy spirit And hopefully you're at this conference because at least you're curious about him. You may be welcoming him. You may be cautious about him. And I began by emphasizing that same spirit that's made the difference from creation until now. And I emphasized is one who hovers. And this is important. Hover is found three times in the Bible. 
once in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And the other two times, it has to do with protection and especially the care of an eagle caring for its fledgling as it learns how to fly. That's why I said it's nurturing. It's even mother-like, this expression of the spirit of the living God. And that's important as we see the expressions of this beautiful person, the third person of the Godhead, expressing himself in the local church and understanding how to do that. When I first came to Trinity, the primary expression was every Sunday, someone interrupted worship during worship and spoke in a tongue. Then someone interrupted worship as the worship tried to reboot and catch a lift again, and then they'd have a prophecy. And then someone else would have a word, and then someone would sing a song. And it was usually off-key and not enhancing to the worship. But God spoke at those times, and I would say this, I want to be very careful and honoring. I would say 20% of those times there was movement there, and about 80% there was confusion, and it was difficult, and you couldn't hear the person, and it went on and on and on. That was challenging for me. My wife, as a discerner of spirits, was very confused by this and very concerned about the genuineness of what was happening in the services. Now, one of the best expressions of the prophetic was when we dedicated babies. Every baby at LifeGate Church, we seek the Lord for a prophetic word, a word of destiny for them. We write it down, and that is on their certificate. And when we dedicate them, we pray, anything that's true of that word would be fulfilled. My children have received that. We've prayed for thousands of children. And we've seen over and over again how God uses this in the parent's life and in the child's life as well. Of course, you always have the prophetic at retreats. It's welcome there. Uh, at prayer meetings, someone would have a word. And we would have the setting that's the best setting for the prophetic. And that's in a group where if it's a newer believer and they have a prophetic word, you're able to say to them, I think that that's not quite right, but your heart is really good. Let's keep seeking the Lord. And so those were expressions in our fellowship. Now, every single one of you has a story. Everyone has a background. My wife's background was really believing all the gifts had ended. Now that we have the Bible, according to this theology, a cessational type uh, theology, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the perfect has come, and we don't need that which is not perfect, prophecy, tongues, etc., and the perfect is the Word of God. If you've not heard that theological position that is a very widespread position so you have that side once you have the bible just do what it says except those things where it's prophecy because this is the only prophecy now and i'm not i'm not against those individuals but uh, i find that that is not very biblical on the other side everything is prophecy and you know these individuals it eventuates to a place where you don't get married unless i seek god and i tell you that this is the one and that was a very popular expression, and it still exists. If you're in that church, please run from that church because I don't believe that that is what God's design is and what is really pleasing to him. So I want to introduce to you, in addition to baby dedications, in addition to those ministering at the front who in our church must be trained to hear the voice of God, must be trained to lead people into the kingdom, must be trained to help individuals receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, must be trained to listen to God and to discern whether or not what God is saying is for them to intercede about, for them to share with the individual, or not to. And in our church, when you've been trained in all those ways, you get a name tag. And so we urge people, if someone wants to lay hands on you and prophesy over you in the entryway and they don't have a name tag, we give you permission to say, I don't know you. 
I don't know. Some of you are wrestling with this right now, and it's okay. In a room this size, you're saying, well, listen, if God says to give a word, you need to give a word. And I want to say in response to that, if God has set elders and a pastor in a fellowship, and they say don't give a word in the entryway, don't give a word. Because it has to do with unity and authority that God wants to express. Now, I said earlier, there is a new possibility for your churches to contemplate. Now, we had this whole potpourri, and then when I became senior pastor 26 years ago, and I said, if you're going to prophesy in this, this sounds kind of negative. It's, it really, this is going to get really, really positive, okay? So it sounds kind of negative. It, it does to me, at least. I'm not liking this right now, and I haven't spoken it yet, so hang on with me, all right? Would you do that? Okay. Wow. And so when I became senior pastor and I said, if you're going to prophesy, we welcome it, but you have to go to a mic. The prophet said, then you ruin our inspiration. Now we're a 1,400 seat sanctuary and someone's prophesying. And people can't say amen because they're way back in the corner, but they refuse to use a mic. Now this is just some individuals. And then we said, you need to clear it with an elder. We don't, we don't want to do that. So you've had those, ba any of you had those battles? Okay. Are you that person? <laughs> okay. All right. So in 2009, after we'd gone through great upheaval, great challenges as a church, we were introduced to a model of prophetic expression from Pastor Tom Lane of Gateway Church. Now, how many of you know Tom Lane? Okay, Tom Lane met the Lord in our church before I was a pastor, and then he moved to Texas, and so we've had this relationship with Tom, a very close relationship for years, and he introduced us to prophetic presbytery. Would you say that? Prophetic presbytery. How many of you really don't have much of an idea of what that really is? May I see your hands? I'm so glad you're here. That's why you're here. All right, everybody, prophetic presbytery. All right, first of all, you need to know prophetic presbytery is a model of prophetic expression to the local church, which I believe is expanding and is something that Radiant embraces fully. As a matter of fact, as we define what a presbyter is, you need to know Pastor Lee is one of the most sought-after presbyters in churches doing prophetic presbytery. Now, I'm going to try to teach. It may not be too cool, but it will be informative. But before I do that, I want to share a word as I asked God yesterday, do you have a word for this group? And he said, I do. Now, I'm going to share a word that I believe God has given me. You need to discern and test the word. Don't just receive it. But when God impresses us with something, and I'm under the authority of this house, I want to be faithful to share it with you. Here's what I heard. You've been asking and wondering and seeking God-inspired curiosity wondering, is there another way? Is there a better way? Is there a fresh way for God's people to hear the voice of God, receive encouragement, comfort, strengthening of God without confusion, without theatrics, or hurtful baggage, exposure, or control? Do I have to give up on hearing a current word for fear of old scars, wounds, and abuses I've sustained? God-ordained curiosity. God orchestrated this appointment for this season for you and for God's people. God says, I'm doing a new thing in my house that my people might be healed empowered and commissioned, and that many on the way to God may experience God's voice and be astonished by love, arrested by hope, drawn to the Son, to his life, and to his freedom, scheduled for you, prepared for you, 
a new wineskin for new wine. Don't be afraid. God is still speaking. Come, receive and become his carriers, his mouthpieces, his counselors of the testimony of Jesus. Okay, let that just settle in. God ordained curiosity. He's giving to you. He gave it to you before he walked in. Can any of you receive that? Lord, confirm the impression of your word. We've just said there's a wide span. Radiant is not becoming Presbyterian. You need to know that. We're going to start by answering, what does presbytery mean? Now, many of you know this, but we read in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. And so he's talking to Timothy. He says, you've received a gift. Don't neglect it. Remember, spiritual gifts and spiritual experiences can atrophy if they are neglected and not cultivated, if they're not fanned, if they're not fed. So he says, don't neglect this one that you received through the laying on of the hands, the impartation, through the presbytery. We read in the NIV, presbytery is the body of elders. And so we realize this. Presbytery comes from the Greek word presbyteron, which is translated elders. That's very simple. A presbyter is an elder somewhere in a local church. So presbytery is a council of elders with emphasis upon maturity of judgment more than mere age. There are many churches that have been birthed, especially when, when, uh, the, when Russia opened up decades ago, and these pastors and elders were late teenagers, early 20s. But it has to do with God's anointing and the wisdom. Now, I'm going to define prophetic presbytery, and then I hope to unpack it. This is a high holy weekend in the life of LifeGate. It is coming in June here at Radiant, and it is a high holy weekend, several days that spill into the new week, where the emphasis is, God, come and speak to us as a people and as individuals. So watch the definition here. It's thick, it's meaty, but I'm going to unpack it. Prophetic presbytery is a time set apart in the life of the local church where a team of seasoned elders who are gifted prophetically seek God for his heart and prophetic message for three different groups. Selected individuals or candidates, couples or individuals. Those he impresses upon their hearts out in the congregation and the church as a whole for the strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. Now let me unpack this briefly. I first want to start with you've already seen it. How many of you saw Pastor Wayne Drain give a word to this church and this conference? How many saw that? What you just saw was an elder, Wayne, who is a seasoned veteran, having planted and led a church in Russellville, Arkansas for many years, who God has given, gifted prophetically to the point where he is a mouthpiece in the nations, a prophet, so to speak, and he sought the Lord, and the Lord impressed him to stand up in front of everybody and proclaim a word that he believes is from God's heart to encourage, strengthen, and comfort this conference. Were any of you encouraged by his word? Any of you strengthened in the weariness of what you do that God was giving you hope? So you see, that is the purpose. You just saw the third aspect of the prophetic presbytery, which is a word for the church as a whole for the strengthening, encouragement, and comfort of that church. Now, when we have prophetic presbytery, I'm going to break this down. That's one of the high points if God gives a word to the presbyter about your church and what's happening in your church. It's a great, great encouragement. So we set apart this weekend. We ask for those we know who are gifted prophetically. One of our presbyters is Tom Lane. 
Another of our presbyters is Wayne Drain. Another of our presbyters is Lee Cummings. Why do you have three? Because you have three separate individuals who you give to them candidates. And what we'd say is this is couple one all the way up to couple 24 or individual 24. Would you seek God and ask him what he wants to say to comfort, strengthen, and encourage this couple? So Lee seeks God for each couple and Tom and Wayne and then when we have presbytery in a service, we'll have one to three couples come and one couple at a time or individual. Don't please don't hear couples. It's individuals or couples. And they will sit on the platform. Lee will sit here. Tom will sit here. And Wayne will sit here. And one at a time, they'll go up. They'll smile at the couple. Usually the couple's nervous out of their brain. <laughs> and they will share, just like I did with this room, what they believe God is saying to encourage them. Then Lee will get up and the people in the room will be shocked because they will say, surely they read one another's notes. No, the author is the same. And that's the reality. And what happens is they share this word. It's recorded those in the congregation have a good idea who these people are. They're shouting. They're excited. And then the couple barely remembers one thing that was said. It's kind of like if you're married, uh, the message at your wedding is the most wasted message in the world. It's the most wasted for you except your funeral. You don't even hear that one. And so... But that's why we say go back and watch it because it was really good. And so what we do is we record that, we transcribe it, and then a mature leader sits down with this couple and walks through the entire word because the words that are shared, they have a timing to them. Number one. Number two, the word that is shared, you know when God prophesies over you, God doesn't look on the outside. He looks on the inside. He judges no one according to the flesh. He sees your spirit. So those of us who are pastors and the candidates are up there and we know the one candidate, he's not really that good of a person. And the presbyter is saying, and God loves you and he has this destiny. And you're like, oh, shoot. And that really frustrated me until I sat down with the presbyters and they said, no, no, we're not, we're not describing what they are in this moment. We're describing the destiny of God in them. And that which is dormant, that which has been tamped down, that which has been harmed or whatever else, we're describing that so that it might ignite their hearts and God would release power through his Holy Spirit. So a prophetic presbytery is, in our case, we have a Saturday night service. We have Sunday morning. All services, the presbyters are prophesying. We have Sunday night. We have Monday morning to lunchtime and Tuesday morning to lunchtime or in the evening. So that gives you a picture of the weekend. It is one of the most sought after, most exciting, most desired things we do. Because after we have the candidates, then what we will do is we will turn to the congregation and we will give them words of knowledge. So during presbytery, the presbyters during worship are watching you. And they are looking in the spirit to see if God wants to say something. And so as they do that, then we'll spend 15 to 30 minutes. And we'll say, would you stand? What's your name? And then we will say, I believe the Lord is saying this to you. It's recorded because you've just gone deaf and uh, <laughs> sort of. And you go back and listen and you're encouraged. And so we do that. And the congregation is greatly encouraged. And then by the end of the time, usually there's a word for the church. Now, I want to unpack a few other thoughts, and then we'll get to a place where we can ask questions. The first thing is, we just saw what prophetic presbytery is. How many would say, um, I still can't see this meeting thing. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. Would you say that? It doesn't make any sense to me. Okay, I'm, I'm good. Are you ashamed to raise your hand? Okay. How many of you say, I think this makes sense. I think it makes sense. 
Okay. Right, it's starting to make sense. So you're having services where you've had people that they're praying and they're fasting or whatever, saying, God, I, I look forward to hearing what you're saying, and we're praying for the presbyter, and uh, then they get up and, and they share these things, and then they share words in season or words of knowledge, and I'll unpack words in season, what that means. Okay, next, why prophetic presbytery? Uh, here's the first reason. God wants to speak to you, and he wants to speak through you. Now listen, Yes, he's spoken through his word, but his word is not a manual that you're trying to follow everything so you can have a good life. You just heard that. That's not what it's about. It's about his glory. It's about his tabernacle on earth expressed through you. And so the reason we have a prophetic presbytery is because God has spoken in the Bible and he's continuing to speak through the prophetic gift now, this is important. So he wants to speak to you. Remember Moses when the elders, the 70, received the prophetic gift. Remember in the Old Testament, Jesus uh, expressed the Spirit by coming upon you, but he didn't dwell in you yet. Okay? And two were out in the camp, and they were prophesying. Joshua says, they're out there prophesying. You want me to correct them? Moses said, and I love this, this is the image that you and I get to live right now. But Moses replied, are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all of the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Now listen, everybody, that was the intention of God that is your experience. And prophetic presbytery is an example for you to watch that this can really happen in you and through you. That's a big deal. Without having the name badge of prophet or presbyter. In the same way Jesus modeled these things, and in John chapter 14, what did he say? These things will you do also, and Greater things will you do because I go to my Father, and if I go to my Father, who will he send? The Holy Spirit. And so God's design is to speak to you, but then he wants to speak through you. And so we see this at Pentecost when it says that God will speak through his sons and daughters, his male servants and female servants. He is speaking right now. God wants to speak to this world and give it life and hope. I was at a restaurant last night. My waiter's name is Nick. I said, Nick, before you leave and get my order, order. We love God and we always pray for our meal. Is there anything that we could pray for you because our God answers prayer? He said, let me think. Yes, my girlfriend and I, my girlfriend and I were moving to uh, Ithaca and uh, in New York, I think that's it. And uh, this is scary for me. And so he became vulnerable at that moment because of God speaking through me. If you haven't ever done that, do that. Don't dare do that unless you tip them 20 plus percent. And, and I mean that seriously. Don't, don't give God a bad reputation. So he wants to speak through you when all the time. He wants to express it. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it says this, uh, follow the way of love. In other words, don't you dare to do anything unless the love of God is compelling you. And then it says this, zealously desire the spiritual gifts. Now here's, here's what he's saying. Be filled with the love of God and then be filled with the power and the tools of God. He says, zealously, zealous, zealous, earnestly, passionately, we just heard it, desire the spiritual gifts, but especially that you might prophesy. So what we're saying in prophetic presbytery, we are holding up this gift is very significant, and God wants it widespread in his body. Why? It is the breath of God through the people of God. Prophecy is the breath of God through you as you're compelled by love. So why prophetic presbytery? God still wants to speak. He is speaking. He speaks predominantly through his word. And through then his words spoken through you and spoken through me. And God is faithful if we would be zealous for him. I'm so dependent upon God speaking. And yet there's a continuum. There are some who predominantly say God told me rather than it is written. 
You know, when you tell the devil, God told me, he's not really impressed as much as he is. When you say it's written, it's settled. When God told me, it, it's mixed with me, and, but this isn't mixed with me. Does that make sense to you? And so, but I'm saying this because of the um, imbalance of some, once this reality that you can hear from God, in the word, beyond the word, never in opposition to the word, they become people who tell everyone, God told me this, and I'm telling you this, rather than God speaking through his word. And we want to be cautious of that. And so, why at our church are we not giving everyone a free-for-all pass? Go and share with everyone. Not, you don't talk with your family or whatever, you know. Because we, we want you to know there are boundaries here. Have you ever thought about this? 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14 is one of the most interesting realities. It is all written because of the tendency of the body of Christ to be enamored with gifts and misuse them. The Corinthian church was a mess. They were immoral. They were fighting. They were disunified. And God still gave them gifts. You know what? I do the same thing with my grandchildren. They can be ornery. They're never really ornery. They can be disunified. I'm still giving them gifts. And I never take my gifts back from them. But 1 Corinthians 14 is written because they have imbalance in the gifts. The first imbalance is not having love in its proper place. The second imbalance is raising some impression you have above the Word of God. The third imbalance is focusing on you rather than on Jesus. And so those are things not in your notes, but they are for free. Here's the second reason. Say it again. Boy, I forgot what I said. Remind me. The first imbalance is... Not emphasizing the word of God, but emphasizing my word. The second imbalance, thank you, the first one is love. The first imbalance is anything that you do that it's not motivated by love. And then the second is when you exalt what you've been impressed over the word of God, not even in opposition to the word of God. God told you to break up with this person, for example. And the third imbalance is exalting yourself above God himself by emphasizing you're the carrier, the big carrier of the word of God. I'll try to remember what I say. It just kind of comes out of me, if that makes sense. Okay, here's the second reason why prophetic presbytery. Everyone is in need of strengthening, comfort, and encouragement from the word of God. And we get this from 1 Corinthians 14, but the one who prophesies speaks to people speaks to people for their strengthening, their encouraging, and their comforting. Let me ask you a question. Let's just be real transparent. How many of you need strength in an area of your life where you're feeling weak right now? How many are facing sorrow, loss, or confusion, and you would appreciate the comfort of God directly addressed to you? Okay? So we see that there's a need for strength, and comfort. How many of you, you know you're supposed to be going this way with regard to intercession or whatever else, but if God encouraged you directly, it would mean something to you. Now look at this. This is this room filled with spirit-filled believers. Can you imagine the waiters, the waitresses, the person you work out next to, what they need? They don't have any identity in Christ. They don't have the indwelling Holy Spirit. They don't have any of that. I was at a table at a fundraiser for Teen Challenge. And this dear woman was across the table. She was in calving season right now, and the weather isn't good, and we had tornado warnings that night. But she also is an advocate in the courts for young people in desperate straits, but she also is a primary reporter for the newspaper. But she also loves God, you could tell. She was working at this thing, taking pictures and whatnot. She was a grandma's age. And the Spirit of God said, tell her my handprint is on her and I'm using her in every situation. It's just, a, it's just an impression. And it's like, well, I mean, what if I'm wrong? And what, what if that doesn't incur? I don't, I don't deal with what ifs anymore. I've done this too long. And afterwards I said, excuse me, sometimes God does this. And I, I think this may be him. Notice that. Did you catch that? Don't hesitate to use may. It, I think this may be him. I just want you to know. 
his hand is on you. Everything, and her face just melts, and, and the tears well up in her eyes. And she says, you don't, you don't have any idea how much that, that means to me. You have no idea. Don't exalt the prophetic into something super-duper spiritual. Realize, where does God want the prophetic? Everywhere you go. So why do we have prophetic presbytery? To show you a balanced expression that's not kooky and doesn't focus on flamboyance. And so everyone needs these strengthening, these encouraging and comforting and so some people are still stuck, though, in the Old Testament, and prophecy equals conviction, confrontation, and exposure. I mean, you've got whole passages of this. And so we find ourselves saying, I love the prophetic. I want to, everyone wants to hear from God. They, they just do. But I'm afraid of getting slapped in the process. Pastor Les, if you're prophetic and you ask me to stand and you say to me, God wants you to know the secret things in your heart he's going to bring out right now in front of all these people to motivate you to change and to repent. You know what I think you should do? Get up and leave as quickly as possible. Because that, I don't believe, well, that's what happened in the Old Testament. Do you realize in the Old Testament, none of them had the Spirit of God in them? Do you realize the Spirit of God is hard at work right now to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment? So he's doing that, and you're loving them. You are not the Holy Spirit. And so get over the habit of having to tell those who've embraced an identity that is not biblical, get over the habit of having to tell them every time you're around them. Show them how much you love them. Yeah, but you know, they, they, they may not realize their sin, whatever sin it is. You know what? They know what the Bible, they do. Individuals know what the Bible's saying to a great extent. Our role is to love people. If Jesus didn't come to condemn, who are you condemning them? You know, Barna survey shows that Christians are seen as extreme, and they are hypocritical, and they're not loving. They're known for what they're against rather than known for what they're for. And prophetic presbytery is here to say God is here to strengthen and to encourage and to comfort, and everyone needs this. What should people expect? The candidates should expect to see how God sees them and what he has for them. Not just who they are, but who they are becoming, how he sees. I, I had a word for a gal in our church, uh, one of the pastor's wives. She always sits in the back, and the word was, God is moving you from the back to the front, from a place of listening to the place of speaking. And she was like, oh, I don't... I don't know if I want that. You know, that's not my favorite prophetic word. But I said, be encouraged. It's going gonna, it's gonna to draw up in you a wellspring that has been in you but has been covered up. She became our women's pastor. Now she is our adult ministries pastor over seven campuses. And her husband, I am succeeding my role to in a year. And so that word is a basis for her to say, God, you were preparing me beforehand so I wouldn't die in the process, and you were showing me this. So the candidates experience that. How do you select the candidates? I pray. I ask all the departments and the campus pastors who they think, but at the end of the day, I pray and I say, I, I think this should be it. I do it in community. I hear God best in community, and I think you do also. I hear him best in community. And so I will select people usually who are serving and people know. Well, that's just kind of the club, isn't it? No. If I put a stranger on the platform and we prophesy and you don't know that person, you'll have a hard time saying amen. And so we put them there so the whole body can see and go, they don't know anything about that person. This is incredible. One of our presbyters came, and our, our pastor who's succeeding me is from Georgia. He's a Georgia Bulldog fan and all of that. And the pastor gets up and says, when I look at you, I, I'm reminded of a bulldog. And it's like, how do you even know these things? Well, they don't. The Lord knows these things. So they should expect that. And then 
everybody should expect God to speak to them either through a word in season, a word in season. This is rooted in Proverbs 15, 23, and it says, a man hath joy by the answer of his mouth and a word spoken in due season, how good it is. Now, are you a King James guy, Les? No, but some of these words we want. The message says the right word at the right time beautiful. And I can't tell you the number of times we give words in season and we say this, any word that's shared that leaps in your heart and you're tempted to say, oh God, would you just say that to me? He just has. Now here's why. Faith, help me with this. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of, see we always get that wrong. It doesn't say that. It says hearing by the word of Christ. A rematos Christoi. Why is that important? You can read this word and not get a word. But when you read this word and it leaps in you, that is a word from Christ. It's a rematos Christoi. Christ is the word, but you can read the word without the word being enlivened. A rhema expression. So when someone's hearing a word in season and it leaps in them, we tell them, we call that a ricochet word. I gave it to you, but it pyong. And if you feel that in your spirit, receive it as a rhematos Christoi. And let that leap inside of you and receive it fully. So what's happening is the body of Christ now, they know a lot of the people out there, but a lot of them they don't. But when they see their face as a word is given, and they melt, and they cry, and they're moved, and all that, when they see that, they, they say, God is here. And often it's the unbeliever who's there for the very first time who God gives a word to the presbyter to give to them. And it is utterly incredible. So the people should all expect a word from God. So you've got a whole weekend where every session you come with the anticipation, God, speak to me, whether it's directly or not. It doesn't matter. And God is speaking, not in opposition to his word, always in conjunction, all those things. And the people are deeply, deeply encouraged. So through the candidate, speaking there through a word in season, God speaking to you through that, through a presbyter who speaks to you. Those things are so powerful. And then through a prophetic team member. Well, what if I didn't get a ricochet word? And what if when they talked to the candidates, it didn't relate to me? We're concerned about us, aren't we? We are. Then we have trained a prophetic team. We've walked them through a course of study that helps them learn to listen for the voice of God. They practice prophesying over one another, kind of Bethelisk, if you know what I mean. And they learn this, and they are prepared. So at the end of each of the presbytery sessions, they cover the front, and they will stay as long as they need so everyone can receive a word from God. So you've got candidates, you've got words in season, You've got ricochet words or rhematos Christoi. Then you have a prophetic team. And then you have the same thing happening for the children. And they're being prophesied over. Pastor Wayne Drain, it comes out in September. God still speaks to children. And so he and Tom Lane have written the book. This is the gold standard for me in understanding prophecy. God still speaks. It's in the bookstore, if I'm not mistaken, Tom Lane, Wayne Drain, and it's emphasizing this reality that God wants our lives to be characterized by first, the presence of God, second, the love of God, third, the voice of God. The people of God stand apart. Moses said, if you don't go with us, how will the nations know that you are God? And so God is Emmanuel, he's with you, you're seeking him, his presence, which is primarily expressed in love, follow the way of love. Nothing matters if you don't love. Why don't you just stop and sit in a chair until the love of God comes on you, all right? There are too many Christians who are claiming to be, and the love of God is not, is not uh, compelling them. How does the love of God compel you? Remind yourself deeply of what Jesus has done for you. 
He said, don't ever forget what you used to be like and how God has changed you. And when you remember that and that you can't do anything without him and his love because Jesus said, I can't do any. Are you convinced yet you can't do anything? You convinced you can't convince anyone? You can't change anyone? But if God is with you, he'll do those things through you. And so you have those groups of people who are impacted. And then you have another group. You have people online. You have people who watch this later, and they're impacted. And so you might say, well, I can see why you do prophetic presbytery. I have a list of things then. God will speak to the church. What to instruct God's people to do? Prepare for, I'm going to let you read that list. Pray, prepare. Uh, don't uh, take God's word and be frustrated because it's not happening right now. God says there's a time for this vision. Wait for it. God's going to move on that. And I want you to know that this whole process has changed us. Our people look forward to it. We choose new candidates every year. The presbyters have no idea who they are until we're in worship, and we say, that's candidate number one over there. That's candidate number two over there. And it utterly, utterly changes the body of Christ and sets a gold standard for the prophetic from which they work from. After prophetic presbytery, we have classes on prophecy so people can learn how to do this in their family, in their life, etc. We have the book, He Still Speaks, and then we carefully help people to not get out of bounds. Spiritual gifts and people are a notorious combination for going too far in one way or the other. If they're not mature in love, if they're infatuated with the gifts, and here's what we say in our fellowship, and then I'm going to shift and then shift again. Spiritual gifts are like a campfire. The Word of God are the stones around the campfire to keep the fire in bounds. And if you move the stones, that campfire will burn the forest down. But if you keep them there, occasionally an ember jumps out. The answer to the ember jumping out is not to pour a bucket of water on the fire. Many churches, because of the misuse of gifts, say, we don't do that around here. Some of you, it's like, we don't do any tongues around here because it got out of bounds. But what we do is we take the tongs of love, we pick that ember up, and we put it back in the fire. And we say, God, help that person. Help us to process this, and we're trusting you for this. Okay, stick with me. You're going to have questions, but I want to give you a couple words that I sought Lord, the Lord for. And uh, if you're in here and... You have been hurt by the prophetic. Would you raise your hand? You've been hurt by someone who prophesied over you. And don't be afraid. Okay, I see your hands. You know, it's even hard to raise your hand. Do you know that? Okay, this word's for you all, and there may be more over here. The tongue has the power of life and death. Something spoken to you that claimed to be God's voice wasn't. You need to hear that from me right now. It's so powerful. The, the greatest abuse is spiritual abuse. And when someone says God is saying this to you and he's not, it, it messes you up. And so I'm here to say in looking you in the eyes, this was not God. And then it killed a dream, a vision, a destiny, and God has sent me to declare to you all, Lazarus, come forth from those things that died. And be unwrapped with the hands and hearts of faith. Be resurrected. Listen, come alive again. Can you receive that? Good. Okay, I want to shift here. Stick with me. You in the back row with a little white. Um, yeah, you. What's your name? Mason? That's a neat name. Here's what I believe the Lord's saying to you. If this is really real, you're saying, Lord, if it's really real, say something to me. I'm not sure how much more I can take, you're saying. How long I can hang on. Jesus says, get ready. Everything's about to shift in your life. Does this make any sense to you? You can hang on longer. 
okay? In this room, there are barren wombs, barren hearts, and barren relationships. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Barren wombs, barren hearts, barren relationships. Okay, ready? I'm opening up right now and releasing a miraculous conception in you right now of life. Receive it in these areas. In your womb, I speak to your womb, and I say conceive now in Jesus' name. In your heart, in your relationships, receive it. For God's conceiving right in this room right now. Just receive that right now. Yeah. Rich, would you stand? I know Rich, but I believe this word's for you. He says, you're a guardian of the flock. You've guarded them well from wolves. And after your great losses, you've resolved to leave none vulnerable. You're a good pastor and a good under-shepherd of the master's flock. It's time to welcome his voice with wisdom and care to forget the past wounds and receive new life and victory from God's own heart to, to those that you have charge over to care for. He's here to shepherd his flock through you at a whole new level. Amen. Amen. Okay, there's some in here who are saying, Phew, this is not what I expected this thing to be. I want this so bad. And some of you are frustrated because you're like, I'm not the pastor. Now, there's a manual as you leave that will go through all the protocol that Radiant has laid out for what? How do you select a candidate? How do you contact them? How do you care for your presbyters? All those things will answer for you. But you're saying here, I want this so bad. I want it for our church. Lord, how are you going to do this? And I want it for me. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Okay, this is the word for you all. You receive this. Class is about to begin. Come find your seat at his feet. Let's start with John chapter 10. My sheep hear my voice and follow me. I'm going to teach you to hear my voice and then to teach others as well. Your tuition is already paid on the cross. It's time for you to grow, risk, failing, follow, and then speak. Raise your hand if that was you. Father, I pray the full tuition that has been paid for them now, Lord, they'd receive it. I pray you'd put a dream in them, a desire in them that would be fulfilled this year or next year or the next year whenever that, Lord, they would be a source of encouragement to their pastor or as the pastor, and they'd begin a journey now, now, of the school of Jesus and the Spirit of God, and that, Lord, the prophetic voice of God would rise up in their life, their family, and in their church. Lord, I pray for that release now in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can you applaud the Lord, everybody? Yes. 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 Oh, God is so faithful. We're so dependent upon him. Okay, we're going to take a few questions. I know we're right on time, and those food lines are huge. But there's some food that's worth waiting for. And so we'll take a few questions. All questions are welcome. Yes. Yes, they do. The candidate, as you read the manual, they've been pursued several weeks in advance so their friends can know and they're praying for them. But we keep the candidates away from the presbyters, especially if they're a main pastor, and then we just show them there. But the candidates have been praying. That's real important. Yes. Yes. Yes, we do. We, uh, no, no, I'm sorry. We schedule it after it's happened so that it works for everyone. That might be a wise thing to schedule it ahead of time. Uh, we do with the candidates. They all follow through. Okay. Yep, they do. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, say you're somebody you need prophetic um, spiritual advice and you're praying and it's uh, like abuse. What's a political correct way to like, have them be 
if the person says something that is abusive and um, incorrect, uh, the political way to answer is, I don't receive that. I don't believe that's the Lord. Please stop talking to me. If they don't stop talking to you, then you go to someone in authority in your church and say, they continue to come and say, my wife is an idiot and that the Lord is telling them. And we, you know, listen, everybody, I've been at this too long to put up with kooky people. And here's one of the most dysfunctional, emotionally unhealthy things Christians do. I love Christians. I am one. They, <laughs> they use God to avoid God. And often they say to you what they're projecting from their own life. Okay, another couple questions. Yes. Okay, she said, how often do you do the presbytery? Every year. We found if we did it every other year, it was too long. People were hungry, and we wanted that model because every church has a churn rate. People move and all that. So at least once a year, okay, at a good time when people can be there. Okay, if a person says, I believe I have a word for the Lord, we say, well, here what we want to ask you to do is write that word down and give it to one of our pastors or elders, and they'll evaluate it. In other words, no one has the authority to turn the service except those who've been recognized by the eldership to lead the service. If a person's really spiritual, they'll write it down, and they'll give it to you. And then here's what they'll do. If the UPS man comes to your house delivers, you hand it, he hands it to you, and they say, well, I'm coming in. And you say, well, why? Because I want to see you open the package. The prophetic role is not to open the package. It's to deliver the package. And so don't, listen, everybody, don't put up with that. Uh, in John Prominsky's seminar, he's giving it right now. You can get the notes from that. He's talking about the prophetic. And how do you relate to prophetic people? People can be very prophetically gifted, but very immature. And we don't reject them, we help mature them. Another couple questions. When God gives you something to the person, it's going to be confirmation to that person. I will say in many cases, yes. In some cases, they're shocked, and it takes time for that to happen. In the case of my daughter, who's been sober to, for two years now, after about eight years of terrible addiction, suicide, she received words from R Wayne Drain nine years ago. They're being confirmed now. Amen. So you're right. Yep. When a person approaches you and says, Pastor, you have a word for me, mm -hmm. and like I've got money and don't. Yes. The best response is, you know what? I wish I had a word for people all the time. The best that I can give you right now without praying about that is that you are loved with an everlasting love, that your identity is rooted in the beloved Son of Jesus, and that is an identity proclamation that's rooted in the Word of God. Better to say, you know what? I don't right now. You seek the Lord and ask Him for a word. And here's one of the most important questions. God... Is there one word you want to give to me? We do that in our restoration process to teach people how to listen to God. Uh, most people want you to listen to God for them. And God wants all of us to listen. Why? He wants to speak to everybody. And so don't explain too much. Help them in this process. Okay, a couple other questions. Are these helpful? Anyone else? Yes, please. This is really good to ask. The guests, when they come in, or they're coming in, do they do any teaching? We usually select one to give the message of the weekend. It's always about prophetic presbytery. Now, you could guess there are all kinds of angles to it because we have new people. We want to proclaim that. We don't always do that. But then these guys and gals, we have both men and women, they're, they're on task. You could just think you're in a service. You're giving words in season. You have these candidate words. They don't always have all of them. They go back to the room they're seeking, so that's a long answer. We don't give them any other responsibilities, and we give them space. That's good. Other couple questions? Has this been helpful? Yes. Do you understand that the Spirit who raised Christ from the dead lives in you to love through you, to speak through you? Holy Spirit, do this in your people. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Amen.